Welcome again, and this time we're going to begin working on project number four. Project number four involves building these curved ribs to build the structure that is going to later be used in project number five. And project number four is relatively quick, straightforward, and frankly a lot of fun because we get to hit things with hammers. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut out the pieces of material that we need. And to help you, we have a full-size template for this particular one. For those of you who don't have access to all my templates, the uh, plans do include information so you can build your own templates. But uh, here we are. So with the full-size template, we're going to also be using annealed material. And uh, I don't have a lot of the annealed material, so we want to be really cautious and not waste any of the material. I'm going to find whatever way I can use the most of the material that I have. An annealed material is very, very soft, easy to cut, and lovely to work with. So here's my first piece, and we need to make two of these ribs for the project. So I'm going to make one piece right here. And it looks to me like if I come across here, it looks like I've got a good sized chunk across here that'll make a nice piece without wasting a lot of my material. Now, normally we would take our material over to the to the shear and we would blank it to whatever size we need, but we don't want to do any blanking on this particular piece because that would cause us to use more than we need to use. So I'm just simply going to cut these out with a pair of snips. And if you haven't done a lot of cutting with a pair of snips, probably the biggest piece of advice when you're cutting with snips, use good snips that have an offset to them. If they've got an offset, it's relatively easy to cut all the way around the corners. If they don't have an offset, by the time you get into your snips, you're really going to be dragging your hands across the material and it's going to cause you all kinds of problems. One more piece of advice is never snip past the end. Never close the snips all the way. Every time you close the snips all the way, you leave a little bitty divot. And I can tell when I see somebody who's never used a pair of snips before and they make this big long cut and there's like a little tear every three quarters of an inch. I can tell that what they did is they closed their snips all the way. Um, in fact, I can kind of see it across here where somebody else cut the back side. I can see some jaggies on there. And if you look by comparison, my cut is a lot more smooth than that. So here we are. We're going to finish cutting our two pieces out. And we're going to just go ahead and snip the video because you don't need to watch me cut another piece out. So one of the things I want you to notice about these two pieces that we've just cut, besides the fact that they're the same, and they better be the same, and that they match our template, I want you to notice how curved they are. And that's because this is annealed material. It's really, really, really soft and easy to move and bend and, and manipulate. And we're going to use the fact that it's easy and so, uh, to move and bend and manipulate to go ahead and cut and, and form it in a rather extreme way. And then what we're going to do after we're done forming it is we're going to put it in the heat treat oven and we're going to heat treat it up to full hardness like our regular material. This is 2024 alloy, which is the good, strong aircraft alloy, uh, but it is in the soft state. We're going to treat it, uh, normally we use it in the T3 condition. We're going to treat this to the T4 condition and because we do it, they put a number two on there because we're number two compared to the factory, which doesn't have to put the number two. So it's going to be 2024-T42 when we're done treating it. Um, the next step that we have to do, though, is not to, uh, not to heat treat it. or Before we begin forming it, we're going to drill the little holes that are already on the template because this template includes everything. It was cut on a CNC machine, and it's in wonderful... Uh, everything lines up perfectly. We're going to take this, line up our pieces on there, and drill the two holes for the centers that are going to form these two openings here. And we also have... Drills, uh, drilled spots for the rivets that we're going to place on the reinforcement strip. All of that's already included on the template. So let's go ahead and drill our holes that we were talking about. I'm going to line up my pieces on the template. Make sure they're lined up properly because this is our last chance for alignment. And then to hold them in aligned position, I'm actually going to cheat and slip a couple of C-clamps. There's other ways that we could do this, but I like C-clamps. Uh, just don't over tighten them because we can really overdo this particular step on this soft metal. We could really crush it pretty good, but I don't want to crush it. I just want to hold it in position. And now here we are. 
I've got my template on top of both of the pieces that I cut and I'm going to drill my two holes. Note I'm drilling on top of a 2x4, not my bed. There's the two holes for the uh, uh, flanges in the ribs. And these are going to become my rivet holes down here. Now, I'm ready for the next step, and that next step is going to be to shape the ribs themselves. The ribs require that they be assembled in a jig, and to fit my jig, I'm going to have to enlarge the two holes in the center of the rib to fit these quarter inch bolts. So quarter inch drill time. This drill, these, these two pins are going to secure it in our form. While we bend the flange around the edge of the ribs. Ready to fold our flange. And the problem we're going to have is as we begin folding this flange over, the flange needs to shrink because it's larger now than it'll need to be when it lays flat. And that's what these individual little fluted areas are, are here for. They're to allow the material to kind of form a rippled pattern in a predictable way that's going to work with our um, rivets. So I'm going to begin folding the flange down, but I can't go very far before it begins to wrinkle. And I'm going to use my little rod here that wrinkle down into one of the flutes. And I'm going to come back to the end and I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm going to go kind of to the middle and I'm going to force it down. And I'm just going to keep working my way along, forcing my sheet metal down into those little divots. and I can come back over here and work it down over my flange. Everything is nice and even. And when I've got a rib that's nice and even, I'm pretty happy with how everything lies. I'm going to be ready to take this out of the form. If you look across here, everything looks pretty good right here. I'm pretty happy with how this one looks. I'm going to take it out of the form, and I'm going to do my best to deburr it, and I'm definitely going to round some corners. Unfortunately, uh, the soft material is going to kind of bite us in the butt when we go to drill out these holes to press the flanges. We're going to drill them out to one and an eighth of an inch using our unibit, and you're going to see a lot of galling on the drill bit as we try and do this. <laughs> my one and an eighth inch circle. I'm going to go ahead and get the other side. Note the clamp that's uh, there to make sure that I keep all my fingers except the one that's getting ready to be amputated. 
And here's my circle, and look at that huge, nasty burr. So we're going to have to cut that burr off. And one of the interesting things about a unibit is a unibit is actually a very nice deburring tool if you use it from the other direction. So I'm going to use the unibit as its own deburrer on this side. Again, across here on this side. I'll probably still go ahead and finish with a manual deburrer, but uh, that gets rid of a lot of the burr, and now I can move on. Now that I've deburred these holes, we're ready to press the flange. And we're going to press from the male side, from the back, into the front, and it's very important that we center up these bending dies. If they're not centered up, we are going to be in trouble. But once they're centered up, we could use the big arbor press, but frankly, this is easy enough that uh, I can just press it with a vise and I'm in good shape. There's my flange. This is most of the rib formed, but I want you to notice that just like on the last one where we, uh, where we folded flanges in, we saw some puckering going on. Here we have a little pucker as well, and we want to straighten that little pucker out. Um, let me show you a tool that does that really, really well. These are called seaming pliers, and they have a big, wide, flat jaw to grab a hold of sheet metal and bend it into whatever position we want. And so I'm going to grab this, and I am going to very carefully re-straighten that piece of sheet metal. And you can see that it does a beautiful job of straightening everything out putting everything back into a straight line. Again, this is annealed material, so it bends so wonderfully easy. I can even do some of this straightening with just my thumb and finger to make everything come out. Before we finish this rib, we've got a couple more things we need to do. We need to put the reinforcing strip in place. We're not going to rivet it in place, but we're going to make it and get it ready. And we have one more thing that we need to do, and that is press our initials into the strip. All right, I've gone ahead and built the reinforcement strip. It's not complicated. You can build it on your own, I'm quite sure. And then I've color-coded where the reinforcement strip is going to go. This one's green and my other one's red, but uh, I probably won't even show you that one. This, these two pieces are going to fit right across here. And when I put them into position, of course, the first thing I've got to do is match drill everything. I'm going to drill, and to match drill, I'm going to uh, drill my first hole, and then I'm going to Clico it. And we've seen that over and over and over again. I guess I don't really need to show you this either, but I am. There's my first one, and we need to Clico it. Now I have my drilling done. But there's something really important I've got to do on this particular section. We're making a sub-countersunk joint. And one of the reasons you're doing this is because the FAA makes me make you do a sub-countersunk joint. And in a sub-countersunk joint, the countersinking occurs on the back piece. So we're going to countersink this piece, the reinforcement piece, and we're going to dimple the regular piece. So that's why I've color-coded these green. We're going to open it up, countersink on the back side. I've got my countersink ready, and I've already set it up to be to the correct depth. And we're going to just go ahead and countersink our little piece. One to be good on in a pinch to grow an inch. And now we are going to dimple this piece to fit into the countersink. To dimple it, we're going to use a rivet and a milk bottle. And the countersunk opening is in between them, inside. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my rivet in position across the top, and this soft material is just simply going to conform to the edge of the rivet. I put it over the top of this milk bottle so that there's a place for the rivet to go and with just a couple of little taps this rivet forms its own perfect dimple exactly as deep as it needs to go right into the surface of the material. Of course I need to do that on all of my 
openings on all of my rivet holes, but it sure didn't take very long. So there's two of them done. Change of the Clico order. This is called a sub countersunk joint because the countersinking is found sub or underneath the surface. So here we are, you can see that these dimples fit into these countersinks. And that is one of our required techniques for countersinking, and you have to make one of those. And that's what we're going to do with this particular piece. Now there's only one thing left for us to do with this piece, and that is, in preparation for heat treating, we need to mark it with something that's going to survive heat treating. If I put this piece in with Sharpie on it, the Sharpie is actually going to be removed in the heat treating. So I've got these little stamps, and I'm going to stamp my initials into them. My initials... M, and those are in there permanently. So as promised, we're going to heat treat these pieces, and I have my heat treat oven here. It's been heating for a while. It's at 930 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're going to leave our ribs in it for about a half an hour. Now before we put our ribs in it, of course, we do need to peel the plastic, because if you don't peel the plastic, uh, we will smell the smell of burning plastic while your ribs bake. There won't be any plastic left. As we said, even Sharpie bakes off the surface of these ribs at 930 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really, really, really warm. And here's my two beautiful shiny ribs. So, beautiful shiny ribs, material taken off of them, 930 degrees Fahrenheit. I definitely don't want to put 900, uh, these into 930 degree Fahrenheit with my hands, so I've got a pair of tongs. We open the door, stick them in, and start the time. So here we are, it's been a half an hour. It's time to take our ribs out and put them in the, the water to quench them all as quickly as possible. Definitely appropriate tools are good. We want to move quickly, take them out, and quench them. That's all it takes to heat treat. They're done. And these, these materials, they're now heat treated to T42, like we said, and they are significantly harder than they were before already. And over the next um, couple of days, they'll go ahead and continue to harden up and uh, get to that full hardness. Now all we have to do is rivet our pre-prepared pieces across the front, and project number four is done. So I've got a rivet squeezer. This one's a hand squeezer, but these little number three rivets squeeze so nice and easy. There's one installed. Two installed, and I can pop my Clico. Three installed. Four installed. That, my friends, is project number four completed. Now, normally we hand in our projects when we're complete, but not project number four. This one you hang on to and build into project number five, and I grade them once they're all completed.